One quick announcement: uh, we're going to be short on. Listen up. We're going to be short on uh, people to be with prayer partners out back. If you don't have a prayer partner and you can stay for a half an hour, please come out and join us and be with one of the children that don't have a prayer partner because we have a few visitors here today that are in the Olympians that aren't usually here. So if you don't have a prayer partner and you can stay, we'd really appreciate you staying. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Brian. All right. Let's just open with a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Hi, Ron Bilby. How you doing, ma'am? <laughs> It's the Lord speaking to you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we lift up your holy name. Father, that name that's above every name. And Father, uh, as we've just heard from our brother Nate, may we be available in season and out of season to preach the word. When it's easy and also when it's hard. And may we be leaders as we learn the things we learn, not just for storing information in our hearts and heads, Father, but so that we can be action, do actionable things with those things, so that we can exhort and rebuke and encourage our brothers and sisters around us. In that precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. So we're still talking about ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. We're going to be covering that topic today and for two more weeks, and then, that, then we're going to finish the series on heaven. There is just so much information on this ruling and reigning. Now, I'm going to start this piece today, and then Brian's going to pick up and, and do the last two weeks. But what we're going to be getting into today and over the next couple of weeks is, so when we're ruling and reigning... How does that work? What is it we're going to be doing? What, what are, what are the, the things that will be happening? And Chris, go to the next slide, please. So the, the two things we're going to be looking at today is one of the things that we touched on last week about this whole idea of being an overcomer. So we want to look at what are the promises to us for being an overcomer. Now, when we touched on it two weeks ago, I gave it to you via fire hose fashion and went through it really fast to give you an overview of it, we're going to go much deeper in it today. Much deeper in it today. And uh, pull some more out of that in a slower way. And then Nathan introduced us to one of the crowns this morning. And so the second thing we're going to be looking at is, how is a service to our King of Kings part of our reward? And the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy talked about one of the crowns. Well, there's other crowns, and we're going to look at those as well. To be honest, I doubt we'll get that far today. That'll probably be left for next week, but we'll see. We'll see how far we get. But as we're looking at these things, this whole idea of ruling and reigning, as you remember then from two weeks ago, we, we got into the, the letters to the seven churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation. And, and real quickly, what I touched on was this idea of the promises that the Lord gives us if we're an overcomer. And overcomer is the word that I like to use, depending on which translation you use, or even where in the scriptures. Because this is one of those unique words that in the Greek, when it gets translated to English, one of the very few times, English actually has more words than the Greek word. So this word could be, could be translated as to endure, or to overcome, or to conquer. Let's just look at those three words just for a second. So this idea of enduring, when you think of enduring, what, what do you think of? Do you think like you've just beat somebody up and you've, you've, you've conquered them? Hanging in there. there. Endure is like just hanging in. If I can just get through this. We think of enduring when we're going through like a really rough time and you're like, man, I know tough times never last. I, I, I'm hoping and trusting in the Lord to endure it. So that's one of the ways that word can be in, interpreted. Well, the second way can be interpreted, and, and certainly in this, this, the letters to the church, I think is, is the best in, uh, way to, to translate it or interpret it, is to be an overcomer. So not only endure it, but endure it and overcome it so that we can move forward. So we're doing actionable things in our life. But if you go to the King James, King James uses the term conqueror. 
which is, which is a good interpretation and translation as well. Because when Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation and he comes back for the Babel of Armageddon, we are going to be coming with him. So are we conquerors? Will we be conquering? Yes. And to be with him, to be coming with him, we would already had to have been conquerors, endurers, overcomers in our life so that we could be coming back in with truly as conquerors. So when we, we talk about this word overcoming, just keep those, those different things in mind because it seems to me that depending on the thing going on in our life at any moment in time, or future events that you might be working through, sometimes it's just about enduring. Sometimes it is about overcoming. And sometimes it is about conquering. When we're struggling with sin, we have to have victory over sin that besets us, right? So we have to conquer that to be an overcomer. We have to conquer those things that have us. Okay. So next slide, Chris. So what's in store for overcomers? Now we're going to get into this. So take your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 2. This is where those seven letters to the churches are introduced. And right now in our worship hour, we're in the book of 2 Timothy. And Paul wrote it to Timothy, that second letter and the first letter, when Timothy was where? Ephesus. Ephesus. And so the first letter that we're looking at here is to the church at Ephesus. Now, I don't have time to go off too far down a left-hand trail, but these, these seven letters to the churches, they were written certainly for real churches that were really there and letters were delivered. This information was delivered to the church in that physical location. Most Bible scholars, though not all, also believe that these these seven letters to the churches are prophetic and that they, they reflect a future church age. Um, that's certainly our stance. That's what we believe. But certainly with, with, with much certainty, I can tell you that when the Lord gave John, the Apostle John, this information that was recorded and written down and included as the last book, in the Holy Scriptures, we know for sure then that's intended for us also. Now, I make that point because sometimes some Bible scholars take this whole book of Revelation, and since it has so much prophecy in it, they just want to set it off to the side and say, this information is not really for the church today. But I would contend that this information is for the church today. In fact, as we go through it, we're going to be looking at it and reading it and studying it, and we're going to see it's definitely for the church today. If, if he's talking and writing these letters to the churches about overcoming so that we can come back to him as conquerors, and we're part of those people that will come back to him for, as conquerors, would it not include us? Would those messages not be important for us? Ridiculous. Of course it's important for us. All right, so take your Bible. We're in the book of Revelation. We're at chapter 2. And Mark, would you, I would need a volunteer for the first letter, the letter to Ephesus. You got, you got it? So I'll give you the first one. Be thinking if anyone want to volunteer for other, other ones. Thank you, Ben. So what was that? I missed the question. So we're reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 1. And Mark, I want you to read down to... The end of that, which I cannot, I think it's verse 7. Okay. But just that section on the, the, to the church at Ephesus, that letter to the church at Ephesus. Hey, Chris, you got that mic on? Yep, it's on. The angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works your toil, your patience, your endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, 
and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the work of the, Nicol, uh, the Nicolaeans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So last week, last time, that was actually last week when we covered this, we were, we were talking about then the promises that the Lord makes through these letters to overcomers. So the first thing we see here is, in the, the, that last verse, he says, to the one who conquers, I will what? Grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, which we read in Revelation 22. So the promise to overcomers is that we're going to be with him where? In that new heaven and that new earth and that new Jerusalem. What a great promise. Now, when you think about things from an eternal perspective, though, what was the one thing he had against the Ephesian church? He, we lost, they lost their first love. And he tells them to repent. Which leads into another conversation I've had with another believer over the last couple of weeks, which has been an interesting conversation. But I was talking about the need as believers for continuous repentance. When we do something that creates conflict between us and the Lord, when we're sinning, that there's a need to repent. It doesn't mean we're, we're not repenting so that we can get saved again. We haven't lost our salvation. We're not trying to get saved again. But we're repenting to remove sin because the Lord tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, so when we repent with this idea of re our continual repentance, always keeping the slate clean be between us and the Lord, what it does is it, it cleans the slate. It takes the, the noise that's in there between us and God and the Holy Spirit. And so we, think we can commune with Him in, in sweet fellowship. When, when, we're, when Charlene and I are having an argument, when we're, there's tension between us, it's because usually I've done something wrong, to be honest. It's, I did something wrong. But we're not having good fellowship. We're not having good communication. We still love each other. We still live in the same house. I didn't walk out of the house. Or she didn't walk out of the house. But, but it's about keeping the fellowship whole and wholesome, wholesome and loving and wanting to do something good for each other. So what do we do? We repent to each other. We apologize. And there's forgiveness in that. If we're practicing forgiveness as a believer, then we practice forgiveness with each other, which restores our fellowship, which is why the Lord does not want us to forget our first love. Because what does it mean to forget our first love? What it means is we're going through the motions of a relationship, but we don't really have one. We may be married to the Lord biblically, but we don't have a, a husband and wife, a bride and bridegroom relationship. We've left our first love. We're going through the motions of the relationship, but it's not real. And the Lord says, I've got just one thing against you, Ephesian church. Because he, he just got done telling them all the good things they were doing. All the good things they were doing. So from an eternal perspective then, what do we learn? We learn to be an overcomer, to have that promise to eat of the tree of life that's in the midst of the garden, which is in paradise, which is in the new heaven, that we need to be repenting of, of leaving our first love. And we're going back to make our, our relationship with the Lord fresh, and a new, take the Lord on a date. Have you ever thought about it from that perspective? Go ahead, Mark. I um, just wanted to add just a little bit. You said that so well, Mike. But I was, I was telling uh, some others that when I'm in sin, and I, and I know in my mind, it's like, you know, and I'm feeling, the other thing is you feel guilty, you, you know, all the negative things that you do. And I want to participate with the Lord. I want to be able to prayer, you know, pray for the saints. And I know I can't do that until I've 
repented, I've you know, confessed, <laughs> you know, and asked the Lord to forgive me. And uh, that's important because I want to be able to participate in the praying of the saints. Mm -hmm. You can't do that when you have that, you know, unconfessed sin. No, I got to agree to that. I'm glad you brought that up because that's when I feel like, like just all I have is dial tone yeah. when I'm calling the Lord. Just, okay, I'm Lord. I would you pray for these things? <laughs> because because the connection is not there. I never. I'm not making the connection because sin is separating me from my love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. I'm going to move on to the next church unless someone else has something else to ask or add. Okay. Chad, you get to read the next one. Next church. <gasps> so this is the church at Smyrna, which is still chapter 2, but verse probably, probably 8 or 9. 8 through 11. Okay, thank you. And the angel of the church in Smyrna write... The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So what's, our, what's the promise that the Lord gives this church if they're overcomers? They won't experience the second death, which means they are saved and they have eternal life. So they won't have that second death and at the judgment be given over and thrown into hell, into Hades, into the lake of fire. So they, they don't have that. Now, what did the Lord have against this church? I, I, heard, I heard the answer. Slander could be, but probably, probably Sam, actually nothing. This church, he just gives a warning. He's saying to them, he's saying to them, this is not all just enduring. You're, you're going to have to be an overcomer because you're, you're going to prison. You're going to be under severe persecution. So this church, he's just trying to encourage, and he's letting them know it's going to be really, really hard. And for that as an overcomer, you know you're not going to experience the second death because they're probably going to experience the first one. They're probably going to be martyred for their faith, which is tough, which is tough. Sam, as long as you offered that, pass that microphone back to Sam. Third church. Thank you, Sam. So this is the church at Pergamum from 12... To the end of that section. All right. Yes. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put the stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immortality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitan, Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except for the one who receives it. So what's, what, are they, what are they, is the promise they get for being an overcomer? 
Get to eat the hidden manna. They get a white stone. What's on the white stone? The new name. So they've got a new name. It's kind of that old song, you know, new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. So they get that. But they're go- that church is going to go through some really crazy things. Nathan, you were talking this morning about all these myths that the culture throws on you. Uh, this church was going to get a, a lot of myths from that culture thrown on them. Uh, Nathan, you mentioned this morning that our culture just dismisses the gospel, and they do. They they call it indoctrination. But in, in, in the, the, this church, what they were saying was, they're, they're putting it together. They're going to they're gonna create their own religion. We're going to take the gospel, and we're going to add to it some of this, and we're going to add to it some of that, and we're going to add to it some of that, and we're going to create our own religion. Kind of like, like uh, our President Jefferson did when he started cutting things out of the Bible because he didn't want those things in his gospel, and he was adding other things in that he'd learned from other religions around the world. This is something we're going to have to really be careful about. Uh, Nathan, I think, articulated it really well this morning. You know, our guest speaker, Nathan, <laughs> is, is that they make themselves sound like they know something, like they've learned something or know something we don't know, and they just bury it under all kinds of myths and broad generalities. So how, how do you really know? I was reading, I, I get an archaeology thing that I get every day. I get a little feed from an archaeology thing. And they found some really cool stuff in, in Israel. But what they always get wrong is, well, this was from a culture 100,000 years ago, or this was from a culture, you know, like, yeah, really? So it starts off the myth that the, this, the earth has been around for billions of years. And if you, if, you, if you then throw everything into this kitty or this pot where everything's been around for billions of years, you're, you're adding so much confusion to the story that, that what is the story then? How, how long has man been on the earth? Why is man on the earth? And they confuse it with incorrect data, but they're always coding the data. Now, I won't, again, I won't go down the rabbit trail, but because I'm nuts, Sometimes I look up articles where they quote these dates and I try to put them in their timeline. They don't even fit in their timeline. They would have to overlap each other to make it work. So they're just pulling numbers out of the air. But if we don't know the truth, like Nathan said this morning, if we don't know the gospel, if we don't know it, then how will we know when the myths get tucked in and other things get added to the gospel? Because the big one we're running into right now is this whole gender identity issue. There's a church that's being sued right now because they have a policy in their membership policy that they have to sign. There's a piece of paper you have to sign. When you become a member here, you don't have to sign a piece of paper that says, I am a member and I hold all the doctrinal statements. I used to belong to a church that did that. But because they have a piece of paper you have to sign... The church is being sued because they don't recognize that there's more than two genders. The church clearly only recognizes two genders, that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. Our doctrinal statement says that. But they're being sued, and it looks like they're going to lose a lawsuit. And it falls on this because they've signed a document where we're forcing somebody to adopt doctrine... And therefore, it's indoctrination, and uh, there'll be a penalty for that. We'll see how that falls out. I'm following that case pretty closely, because their wording matched our wording. We just don't have something you sign. But what's the world doing? Is the world forcing people to believe that, too? They, they, sure they are. they got a complete cancel culture. They can cancel your life. They can make sure you can't get credit. In fact, right now, oh, I'm going down a rabbit trail. The the company that actually controls the most cash in the world, a company called Blackstone, run by Larry Frank, wrote a letter to all the t- companies that have owe him money, which is a lot of big companies like Disney, and told them, if you don't adopt these policies, we'll give you a, a negative rating on your credit, which means when they borrow money, they're going to pay more for the money. That's blackmail. So corporations are being blackmailed to believe these, this, these wokeism things, but yet they say, we're, we're indoctrinating people because we recognize, the scripture says, that there's a man and a woman. 
It's just, it's just crazy stuff, folks. Those are the myths you're talking about. Go ahead. It's right here, too. Oh. It sounds like this. Oh, wait. Give me the microphones. So I want to get this on the... I've got to get this on. This sounds like this is... It's up, right? Bottom one up. There we go. This sounds like this is far away, like something that's not here, you know, this is, this is you know, it's not going to touch us and some other country, but it's, it's actually right here. It's in Oakfield School, right? There is compelled speech in Oakfield School to use the preferred gender pronouns. The teachers are required to do that. If you know any teachers in Oakfield, they're suffering under this right now, today. And it's, 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 it's a new concept, compelled speech. You would think that the First Amendment would protect us from that, but it doesn't, apparently. And we have compelled speech. And even even the businesses lie. over over 100 employees in New York State yep. have the same thing. Right. Any yep. private business. You're compelled. You have to say things that are a lie. Or say nothing. So you, you, can't, you can't say what you believe, because then you're breaking the law, because you're not saying that. So we need to be praying about these and be aware about these things. But we know who holds the future. We know that we're going to be overcomers. We're going to be endurers. We're going to be conquerors. And we're going to be with him in the new heaven and new earth. It's nothing for us to be worried about at all. We need to be walking in the joy of the Lord. But these are the things that are happening. So, you know, when we talk about enduring and conquering, at least till this point, we really weren't experiencing it like, like those folks are on the map. But we, we will be. Maybe not old folks like me, but some of you younger folks, maybe. So it's just something to be praying about and thinking about. Okay, the next church. The church at Thyatira. Steve, is there a question or do you want to read it? I can read it. Thick, there you go. I have a lot of questions all the time. <laughs> and unto the church, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to, his, to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I give her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already Hold fast till I come. And he that cometh and keepeth my work, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over all the nations. And he shall rule with them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Thank you. So, to this church, what were they promised for being overcomers? To rule I will give the them power over the nations. To rule with him, to have power over the nations. What are we talking about right now? Ruling and reigning, right? So, this, this, he's, he's specifically mentioning this one as well. So, ruling, but how, is it, how are they ruling? Ruling with a rod of iron. Yeah. Let me just touch on something today. Brian will probably go into it a little bit deeper next week. But when we come back with Christ, after the seven-year tribulation period, we're going to come back with him for that battle of Armageddon. 
And obviously Jesus will win that one very quickly. And then we will move into the thousand year millennium period, which is before the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. In that thousand year reign, referred to as the millennium, Revelation chapter 20, we will have to rule with a rod of iron. When we rule and reign with him in the new heaven and the new earth and the kingdom, we won't have to rule with him with a rod of iron at that point. So when it talks about us ruling with a rod of iron, it, it is referring to that millennium period because there is going to be a lot of people that survive the tribulation period and move into the millennium period. And I've talked about my Tesla and the white lines on the road. Those lines are going to get really tight. You know, he tried, Jesus is not, as ruler, ruling from the earthly Jerusalem. He, he is not going to put up with anything. And we'll be ruling and reigning with him. Or whatever the rules are, we'll be helping him rule. And we'll be ruling with a rod of iron. So that when they come to the end of the millennium, but it's going, to be, it's going to be good. Think about all the good things that are going to happen during the... Think, being led by Jesus, not two parties, not three parties, not five parties, not goofy things that our politicians do. He's just ruling. And every decision he makes is going to be fair and righteousness and holy, which sounds really cool. You're like, why would anybody rebel at the end of that? After all, and then the hospitals will be getting fixed. And then people maybe, because there's new, new inventions, less people will get sick. They're going to live for a long time. It's going to be really interesting. But human beings don't like being told what to do, right? Remember being a teenager? Remember being an employee of any company in the world? <laughs> we don't like to be told what to do. So for a thousand years, we're going to be told what to do with really tight lines. And we're going to help him do it. And when he lets Satan go for that little season at the end of the millennium period, it tells, says millions that cannot even be numbered are going to come with Satan and, and come back and surround the city of Jerusalem, which will then be another battle that ends really quick. <laughs> the, uh, that last passage there, uh, I know Mark and I have talked about it a lot. It sounded a lot, well, it sounded like just a... Uh, Sounded well. I'll say it. Sounded a lot like the God of the Old Testament, and uh, and it, it, it relates to what uh, we heard in the in the in the in the message today. You're either going to fear uh, and hate God, uh, or you're going to be happy that He is who He is. Uh, it, you know, he, he he. I don't think uh, Jesus was mincing any words there uh, when He said yeah. what's going to happen. Uh, to those that uh, don't believe. Uh, so. he, he will be a benevolent dictator. And, don't uh, miss the second word. <laughs> dictator. Yep. But be benevolent. Friendly, loving, caring, trying to make everything better. And, and again, think about a world, if you can even fathom this, where, you know how we sit back and we, we judge every political decision out there? Because we can. People are still going to judge every political position out there, but he's alone with making them. And they're always going to be fair. They're always going to be righteous. They're always going to be bringing good things. But even, even us, if we admit it, whenever something happens that's a good thing, we don't like it. I, I, sometimes it's fine. I get entertainment. Republicans do something right, and the Democrats find something to tear it down. Democrats do something right, and the Republicans do something to tear it down. No, nobody can be happy with a good thing if the other team comes up with it. So therefore, you're, not, nothing's ever good. There won't be another team, but there will be a lot of grumblers. So that by the end of the thousand year period, there's going to be an army that's going to want to come against the Lord Jesus Christ because he painted really tight lines and we want to do what we're going to do. This is where we take him out. Where we, this is where we're going to march on Jesus and take out, take out Jesus. It's a, rebellion. <laughs> it's a rebellion. It's a full out rebellion. And it'll be led by Satan for a little season and, he, and the Lord will end it. And that's when the final judgment happens. Okay, I don't want to go any deeper than that because I'll be stealing Brian's thunder for next week. And I will give him a morning star. What's the morning star of that? Do you know that? I do, and there's about five different answers. Okay. Essentially, Jesus. Well, okay. that's just Jesus. Okay. Jesus is the bright and morning star. Okay. Um, there's other thoughts on that, Mark, but but so yeah, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I can't again. I, can't, I don't want to give away too much of Brian's class next week. All right.
Come on to the church at Sardis. Give it to Mr. Malone right behind you, Charles. The church at Sardis. This is the beginning of chapter 3. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen that which remains is about to, that which remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge the name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So what does the Lord promise this church for being the overcomers? He'll never blot their name out of the book of life. I heard dressed in white, both correct answers. So if they confess Jesus to those around them, then he will confess their name to the Father. Right? That's right. Three awesome promises. Let me just focus on the, this, the garment being white, being white garments. Because that was, if you come back now, what, what did he hold against this church? That makes the, the white garment even stand out more. So what did, was it he held against this church? They're dead. I still didn't hear it. They're dead, not alive. They're dead, not alive. So they, they look like they're doing the right things. Thanks, Mandy. I'm, I'm deaf. I'm sorry. So, so they, they look like they're, they're dead, not alive. They're, there's no excitement in it. What, what a, how, it was worded another way in there too. In, in a, another, they won't wake up. That's a third way. There's still a second way, but they won't wake up. They're, they're like sleepwalking. There's a third way. What? Their deeds are unfinished. Their deeds are unfinished. It says that they're not complete. They're, they're, they're walking. But let me describe it this way. Saw a political ad one time, and the, the, the guy that was running for office, the other party ran the ad trying to say that this guy doesn't make any commitments to anything. And it showed him sitting on a fence with a foot on one side of the fence and his left foot on the other side of the fence. That's what Jesus is saying here about this church. They've committed to nothing. They haven't finished anything. They have a form of godliness, but they're not really godly. They, they're not being righteous. They're not repenting individually. They're, they're living in such a way that they have that form of godliness, but zero power, and therefore they have nothing complete. But some, some are going to be overcomers, and they're, they're going to have the white garments. So the white garments gives us the key or the clue to what he's saying here. To have the white garments, that they need to be righteous. So the Lord is pointing out in this church that those who are complete and do live righteously and do overcome, when you get here, we're going to give you a white garment that shows your righteousness. You had a question, Steve? Thought? Oh, wait, let me get the microphone. Where'd it go? Charles has it. Sorry. Just for the the people tuning in. what I see there is, is, is uh, what does you know, God have against them was, wow, well, you know, what's going on in a vast majority of churches today? Um, uh, they're just checking the box. They're getting along to get along. Uh, they'll just nod their head and smile instead of having uh, men from the pulpit preaching with conviction, with tears, uh, with the Holy Spirit. And I think that's what I got out of that. Oh, it's dead on. You know, Nathan was talking a little bit about that this morning again. Thank you, Nathan, for preaching half my Sunday school class. It was good. It reinforces it. I love it. You know, but Nathan was talking about, that's not just for the person standing in the pulpit, the things that he was saying. It's it's for every one of us. I mean, being righteous, preaching in season, out of season, that's just not for the guy standing up there. That's for every one of us to be ready in season and out of season, when it's convenient, when it's not convenient. And doing those things. Want to pass that back to Connie? 
No, I want you, I want you to say it out loud. So what Connie said was, so they had soiled garments, that's what the church had, but for the ones that are overcomers, they're going to get clean and pure and righteous garments. Yes. Okay, clock's ticking. That's church. Oh, who do we want to have? Who do we want to have? Gene. Gene. Yeah, good idea. Right? Give it, pass it right back to Gene. Thank you. The church at Philadelphia. And unto the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, <clears throat> These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go, go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So to this church, to the, over, to the overcomers, to the conquerors, what does the Lord promise this church? There's some repeats from the other ones, but not all. Be a pillar in the temple. That's a, that's a new one. That's additional. And it's interesting that he, he uses that terminology here in this letter, I think, but I'm not positive, that it's because this church has a gospel ministry that seems to be bringing souls to the Lord. That's, the, that's one of the things they seem to have right. Jamie? Exactly. So he's, that's exactly what he's talking about, Jamie. He's going to keep them by rapture from the hour of trial. Now, that's only in the prophetic sense, because this church wasn't raptured. Rapture hasn't happened yet. But he's protecting, he's letting them know, I'm protecting you. So this church got special protection in that day, and then also prophetically, as the church will, through the rapture. Yep. What else? Stamps his name on him. This, this, is a, this is a little bit different than the Lord giving you that white stone with your name on it. Uh, when the 144,000 witnesses are sent out from the Lord uh, in, during the tribulation period, during that seven-year tribulation period, he, he puts a stamp on their head. We, I don't know if it's going to be readable, not readable, but he has marked them as his. And there seems to be an indication that when we get to heaven as part of our glorified bodies, besides just that special name he gives each one of us, it, it seems like he's going to mark us all as his. Don't know what for sure why. Do we need it to get through the gate? I doubt it because our name will be in the book of life. We wouldn't be existing there if we didn't already have our name in the book of life. But he's going to label it. They're ours. They're his. Kind of like when a farmer brands a cow. That, that beef cow is mine. Here's the brand. Circle M. Moomaw's cow. Like that. He's, he's branding us as his. We are his possession. What was the thing that he did not like about this church? Was there something here about this church he did not like? Related to the Jews. 
Yes. There's, there's liars in the group, and they're, they say they're from the house of Israel. They say they're Jews, but they're, but they're not acting like it for sure. When, when Tim Munger comes in April, ask him this question. I'm going to give you half the answer. Where do the most Jews live in the world? By number. I'm going to give you the answer. The United States of America. More Jews live in the United States of America than live in Israel or any other country, if you divide them by country. The other interesting thing he'll tell you, but I'm not going to give you the answer. Ask him how the Jews in America support the country of Israel. I'm not going to give you that answer. Ask him. I think you'll be amazed by that answer. All right. What else about this church that we want to mention? All right, let's go to the last church, the church at Laodicea. Gene, you had the mic, right? Take that all the way back to Matthew, Matthew Buck. Well, he's got his glasses on, so we can pick on him today. Oh, he took them off. No, put them back on. <laughs> this is the church at Laodicea. Now, before you, before you read it, Matt, I'll just make a statement. I mentioned that, that the seven letters were written to seven real churches that really existed then. I also mentioned that prophetically, there's, there's a an understanding which we would uphold to that these, these seven church, church letters were also talking about church eras. So this is the last church era. So if we really are in the last days, which it seems like it, we, I mean, they probably felt the same way in 1900 during before the First World War and probably in 1940 before the Second World War. But it seems like we're in the last days. So if that's true, then this letter is probably really talking about the church of the current culture mm -hmm. and really directed much stronger at us. Okay, Matt, go ahead, read it, if you would, please. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, Matt. So again, as conquerors in this church, what was this church promised? That we'd rule and reign with them. The very, very topic we're covering. So we promised this promise that we would be ruling and reigning with them again during the millennium and during the, the, new, the new eternal kingdom, which is awesome. What was the thing he had against this church? Lukewarm, lukewarm. Let, let me just share you a bit of personal testimony. So Charlene and I both got saved at the very end of our high school career, if you want to call it that. Um, and I went away to college down in Ohio for, for a couple of years, and she stayed up here and went to ECCC, Erie Community College. And we started dating in high school. We knew we wanted to get married. I came home. We got married. She grew up in a Catholic home. I grew up in a nothing home. My grandmother was very religious, but not with who I'd never met, but not my parents, really. We didn't go to church as kids. And so we get married, and to keep her parents happy and her relatives happy, we got married in the Catholic church, even though we were both believers. It made everybody happy. They showed up. Otherwise, they weren't going to come. It was how be this woman to marry a Catholic, this Catholic woman to marry a Protestant. I wasn't a Protestant. I was still... Trying to figure out what they even meant. Um, so, but th there was a lot of things we were doing in our life to make people happy. 
So we would go on Sundays to the Catholic church in the morning. And then when that ended, we'd go to a, a Bible church where we'd make other people happy. And we were just attending church to keep people happy. We were not attending church because we love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. But one time we were together and we were reading this very passage and we realized we needed to repent because we, our Christian life was about appeasing other people's view of our Christian life. It wasn't about building relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't about trying to learn and discern and disciple others. And we, we just had a come to Jesus meeting her and I, and we said, that's it. We're going to stop doing the things to keep people happy. Now, guess what happened? They were not happy. <laughs> so we didn't worry about keeping them happy because now they were unhappy. And that was even worse because now that Protestant guy stopped her from going to the Catholic church and doing things. And, and so every movement we have made since that point has been micromanaged or micro-analyzed by the family. But it's interesting thing that what happens over the course of time is over the course of time, their perception now is, I'm a godly person, and therefore I'm the family priest. And when we ever get together, even in Catholic gatherings, I'm the guy that prays. Uh, which is, isn't that crazy? Um, but when we walk a life of faith and not just the walk of keeping people happy, people recognize the spirit in our life and they recognize the fruit in our children and in our relationships and in the things that we do and even in the things that we don't do. And uh, that first church that we attended was a very legalistic church. And they, in fact, they had a piece of paper that you signed. Remember, I talked about a membership you signed. We, that was the church I went to. We signed a piece of paper. But that piece of paper not only said that we ascribed to these doctrinal things, it also said that we wouldn't do things. It said that we wouldn't grow facial hair. It said we wouldn't go to movies. It said we wouldn't play with cards. And I can go on and on. The list of things was on the piece of paper. Now, the interesting thing is we never signed it because that was the beginning of our awakening of living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, I, I can't sign that piece of paper because I'm still going to go to movies and I'm still going to go to theater and I'm still going to play with cards because no one had convinced me scripturally through the Bible, even to this day, that that is sin. Now, I'm not going to go to things that are not wholesome, that are going to teach me pornography and those kind of things. But would I go to my kid's play? Because what that thing said was, if your kid does a high school play, don't go. And they, that, they enforced it. Why do I say all that? I say all that because when the Lord wrote to this church, they weren't hot or cold. Are you in or are you out? Lots of people come to church. Sometimes. But how many of them love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart and their soul and their mind and are repenting when they sin and are trying to live a righteous life? And I am so... I was going to use the word proud. I'm going to use that word. I'm so excited to be part of this body of believers that doesn't believe that. We all believe that we all should be doing these things. And we do. We're all attempting to do these things. We're all somewhere in a different place in our spiritual walk with the Lord. Some of you are at the beginning. I'm near the end of my spiritual walk with the Lord. Been saved about 47 years now. But we're all in a different place in our walk with the Lord. But this letter was written to our church age. And the easy thing is to be hot or cold. If you went to the statistics is how many Americans go to church on a Sunday? It's still a very big number. It's still the majority of people in this country. But how many of them do you think are Christians? How many of them do you think has a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Probably not that many. And it's interesting sometimes you talk with visitors that come here or guest speakers that come here. And the one thing they recognize right away when they come here is this group of believers is different. Talked to John Bladeen about his visit last week. He was excited to be here. He, 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 made it, he made verbal comments back to you while he was speaking. This church is different. This church is full. This church sings. This church is vibrant. I'm sensing something different. It's probably called the Holy Spirit. He said it. We 
we went to a, a, my granddaughter got married this week at First Baptist Church in Albion. Big church, probably sits more people than this church does. You know, beautiful big brick church, beautiful glass windows, really neat. Talking to some of the people that work there. How many people do you think go there? Fourteen. Fourteen. And they've got to do, let people come in from the outside to do weddings because they need the money to pay the heat bill. That is not where we're at, folks. I mean, what the Lord has done here is amazing. Yeah. A lot of social justice messages on the wall. Nothing about Jesus. Nothing about salvation. Nothing about the gospel. And, and the attendance indicates the same. Folks, we are this close to being that same church. When we individually don't measure ourselves on whether we are hot or cold and don't repent of the things that make us cold and don't come to the Lord on a date to renew our love relationship with Him. Now, again, I, you guys are doing that. I'm not saying you don't do that. I'm saying we, we need to be better at that. Because the churches that lose that, they lose everything. I mean, if, if somebody in the world wants to join a club, there's all kinds of clubs to join. And if all the church becomes is a club, then why would I join the church club? I'm going to join a shooting club because they shoot. Or I'm going to join a racing club because they race. But why would we come in fellowship as a body of believers? So that we can exhort each other and encourage each other and charge each other up when we charge and kick each other in the butt when we need kicked in the butt. Because we can, because we have a loving relationship with each other and a loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I'm so thankful for so many of you over the years that have come up to me and when I need a kick in the butt, you give me a kick in the butt and you feel comfortable to do that. And each and every one of us need that. We do. We need that. And if our brothers and sisters can't hold us accountable, then who can? I mean, the very fact that we, that we, we do rotate our, our preachers and the people that speak. Uh, Nathan spoke this morning. What do you think it says to his kids when he gets up there and, and gives a message? And, or when, his grand, when the kid's grandfather gets up there and gives a message? It speaks volumes, doesn't it? Do you think then they watch our lives at home just as close? Our kids and our grandkids hold us accountable. Our nieces and nephews hold us accountable. Our brothers and sisters hold us accountable. So those are the things, folks, we have got to become very aware of and, and not modify our behavior just because people are watching us. I'm saying modify our behavior because it matters as a matter of righteousness and a matter of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ so that we are endurers, that we're overcomers, and that we're conquerors so that all these promises he gives us will be ours. Now, Nathan also mentioned this morning from 2 Timothy about this crown. And if you look at the bottom of your sheet, Brian's going to pick up talking about the crowns that the Lord has for those that are overcomers. When we get there, we are going to get awards, rewards. We're going to get crowns. And again, I'm not going to steal Brian's thunder, so I'm not going to talk about it any more than that. Bless the clock is ticking. But when we live a righteous life, seeking the Lord Jesus Christ, reading his word, brainwashing ourselves, indoctrinating ourselves with the gospel, amen. What's what we need to be doing? Because I guarantee you this, if we're not indoctrinating ourselves with the gospel, then you're indoctrinating yourself with all those stupid myths that are out there that Nathan talked about, and then you think those are true. And we do that. We do that as Christians, which is why we got to study the word. Go, well, I believed that. All right, let me close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are excited that you would write these letters to the churches and share them with us. And these letters show us the things that you've promised us if we're overcomers, when we spend eternal with you. Father, help us to have that eternal mindset, eternal thinking, the eternal perspective as we've been talking about. When we look at these topics and cover these things, uh, Father, help us to have that. And Father, remind us too in our own, each individual life, the things that the Lord pointed out in the letters where we, we weren't paying attention, the things that we got wrong, leaving our first love 
and all the other things, Father. Help, help us to examine ourselves, uh, find these things in, each, in ourselves individually, and repent of them so that there's no, nothing hindering our relationship with you, nothing hindering our prayers, nothing hindering our walk with you, and then certainly then nothing hindering our walk with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, it's because of your son's blood on the cross that was shed. It's from his death and his burial and by all power, his resurrection, that he now sits on the right hand of the throne of God, your throne, Father. And he's telling us we will have the opportunity, the joy, the pleasure to rule and reign with him because your kingdom is what it's about. Your kingdom is the kingdom that matters. In the name of your son, we pray, Jesus Christ.